and welcome to another episode of Lens of Reflective Leadership. Um, this is podcast number five, so we made it over the you'll fail after three, so we're on five, and we're almost done with this book, and we have another guest, so um, how exciting is that, Carrie? So welcome, Whitney. Um, Miss Whitney Shiro, she's an exceptional ed teacher at SAR. Tell us a little bit about yourself um, and why you even want to join us on this crazy adventure of this podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I have been with Richmond Community Schools. This is my 20th year. Um, I've been a special educator all 20 of those years. Um, I spent the majority of my career at Community Youth Services in a program where students went that needed significant um, behavior reconstruction, um, along with a lot of academic deficits. I decided to make a shift in my career four years ago and move back to an elementary building because that had been all of my undergrad work. And so I got to come to Star Elementary. This is my fourth year there. I continue to be a special educator there. I get to work with specifically um, third and fourth graders as far as academics goes, and then K through fourth grade as um, kids need regulation throughout their school day. Awesome. So you work with the gen ed population as well, right? Not just, I do. all right, perfect. You're not just the exceptional ed. And I am so excited for this chapter because, um, you know, we're talking about connections over compliance and your guys' story, Carrie and Stars and Whitney, your part of that story is shared in this chapter. So we're gonna dive deep into that. But before we do that, I think at the beginning, um, as we move through this pandemic, we have to acknowledge, and, and Dr. D said it, that anger is the bodyguard of fear. We see that in adults and kids, I think. Um, and the one thing that she says is the first step is simply making our staff, our building, our district aware that there is a difference between coercive re regulation, which is that traditional model of discipline, and co-regulation, which is the foundation or you know the fundamental principle of brain-aligned preventative discipline. So she talked a little bit about on page 122 the, the steps, and she does a really good job comparing and contrasting um, how you would go through discipline in the lens of that brain reflection. And so um, I don't know if you guys want to chime in on what before you tell your story, but I think it's important that it all starts with the adult. We've said it over and over again um, and how in co-regulation we're aware and we're paying attention um, to our bodies, our brain states. We're in that traditional discipline. Step one, we always notice the behavior of the child first. And so I think that's important to continue to put in front of everyone. And then step two, mm -hmm. we focus again in that co-regulation, we're focusing on the child, that sensation. We know when that kid starts to show a tick or starts to his head, his or her head down, we know that there is a feeling or a sensation that's going to be to a, a lead to a behavior again in the coercive re regulation or that traditional, it's what's wrong. And um, sometimes it's the defiance, sometimes it's shutting down, but all of that looks like disrespect and it looks like it's being done to me. Uh, step three is that assertive tone, making sure we're aware of our body language and how we're talking to kids and making sure we're modeling um, our regulation before we jump in and talk to a kid. And the traditional is that aggressive tone, the loud yelling towards kids um, that can come from classrooms, um, teachers, cafeteria staff, office staff, principals, um, step four is really making sure that we give them time. It's not about coming down to the office and saying, let's talk about it, which is the traditional. It's giving kids time and space, and sometimes the adult needs the time and space. And then that step five is meeting their needs. So making sure you have a routine of regulation you can put in front of that child versus just shouting consequences. If you don't do this, you're going to go to timeout or you're going to have a lunch detention and really focusing on the isolation. And then that last step is the thermostat versus the thermometer. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about going above and below the line, um, what you guys did with your staff, but we want to mm -hmm. be, we want to be the thermostat mm -hmm. where we stay at that, that one 70 degree mark while we're talking to kids versus raising our temperature. Um, as kids present that. So that's the foundation. Then she goes deeper into um, looking that through the lens of the ACEs. What are your thoughts? Um, 
I know Whitney, we really want to hear from you as far as the teacher perspective, because we've been there, but we've been out of the classroom, obviously a lot. And then obviously looking at data, knowing even how we even get here. So Carrie, what do you think? Where should we go? There's a lot. We talked about that. Well, I really, I kind of wanted to start. Well, I really, I kind of wanted to start and I specifically like, so it's super cool to have Whitney here because, um, you don't really know it yet, but you're kind of sitting in the presence of amazing. So that's kind of important to know in terms of just somebody who knows how to regulate and, uh, and think about kids. I was really, the minute you started to talk, I really thought an awful lot about number two. And the only reason I'm gonna mention this right now is to preface it a little bit, because in the role and that women holds, and in the mindset of a lot of us, we often think about our most dysregulated really loud, sometimes aggressive kids when we start to look at this framework, or I guess maybe I'm admitting that I do. And I just got to point out that um, for all of us, knowing and understanding that we're looking at a child's behaviors through sensations and feelings is just as important for the fawn, the kiddo who doesn't speak, who kind of shrinks in on themselves, as it is for the kiddo who expresses themselves in maybe um, the loudest or most dysregulated ways. And so that was just something I wanted to do a preface about. Um, because sometimes we think about that, and later on when she gets in to this she talks about having those medium level supports and the high level supports which would be recess resource rooms where we probably see a little bit more reset Winnie, what i really want to know for you i think one of the things that i thought was the most important i mean you've, you've had an entire career dealing with kiddos who have been labeled i mean in a lot of different ways particularly adolescent kiddos um early on in your career at the state hospital and then in the pis Talk to us a little bit about those experiences and how your experience with those kiddos has changed over time. It's definitely changed in so many different ways over time. I think about my first year and um, being aware of myself was most important, probably up until about year five. Um, all of those days, am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? And then what am I doing? And we all have those days and being aware of that. Um, I think when I first started out in my career, very clear and concise behavior expectations were given. And those same expectations were supposed to be for every kiddo. And I think as um, I've grown as an educator and through time, we can have a lot of similar expectations and procedures for kids, but as we learn and grow together, every kid is different. I can't have the same expectation I would have for Carrie Ann as I would for Kristen, Kirsten, sorry, because they're two individual, they're two individuals that are completely different. And I think that that's been the, the biggest thing I've learned and grown to respect um, as an educator. We have to adjust and adapt on a daily basis. And what we put in place for a kiddo one day, we may have to adjust for the second day. We have to learn and grow together. And I think one of the biggest pieces, especially when I came to STAR, coming back into those little tiny brains, um, having conversations with kids about, hey, this is what we're gonna try today. We want your feedback. We want you to be a part of this plan. What do you want? What do you want to work on? It's okay to have the conversations with kids. It's important. It gives them the ability to learn and grow with us. And most importantly, it creates the relationships that we need with our kids. And I, I can reflect back and I think about whether or not I created the relationships that we build now compared to even five or ten years ago you know was i taking the time to meet every single kid in my classroom's needs and i can sit here and say and it's kind of you know it's a big swallow but i i don't think that i i was necessarily um, but i think now that when i look back even this year and as we continue to grow with dr Lori, that if i don't have that connection or that rapport with a kid whether it's a student with that receives special services or a general education kiddo i'm not going to get anywhere and when i create that relationship with the kiddo um it's trickling into better and more parental involvement i'm not calling home anymore just to report that 
Little Carrie, you had a fantastic day. calling home because Carrie had an amazing day. And this is what we accomplished. This is how we started our day. We had a little pickup um, before breakfast or lunch, but this is how we're ending today. And I'm including that kid now in the conversation. Home. You need to know. I don't have, I have nothing to hide. It's important that they're on the same page with me and that they're very home knowing this is what my teacher said. That's awesome. Well, I wonder. Um, no, I just keep. No, I, no go ahead. I'm no, a little delayed, I just so keep I feeling like in my head, I just keep hearing um, fair doesn't look equal. And that's hard for teachers sometimes. And so mm -hmm. Whitney, as being that one that provides that that break or that experience that kids need, because it's not a consequence, we're proactive, we're setting up those experiences. Have you had have you had difficulty with moving some teachers in and noticing that you're not rewarding the negative behaviors, but you are giving them experiences to be able to regulate? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I work pretty closely with my third, third and fourth grade team. Um, in the past, what I've noticed, since I, especially since I've come to STAR, I've noticed that more teachers are not just perceiving me as the teacher that works with the special kids. She can help us in different realms. Um, it's taken several years to kind of crack that because there are a couple teachers that are still a little apprehensive about it. I, I'm working with a third grade team and one of my third grade teachers, if she was sitting right here, I, I could have the same conversation with her. She's a year or two from retirement. And some days I just have to say to her, okay, let's think about how we're handling this and let's think about what we can do different for tomorrow. At the beginning of the school year, I think she thought, oh my gosh, if this lady does not leave my classroom, I'm going to kick her out. But now she's coming to me, she's coming and seeing me at the end of the day, um, and we're having those conversations. And so it's really been a whole growth mindset for educators. If we don't help each other and have this mindset together, wow, it's, it's just going to continue to get tougher and tougher. Um, I think that teachers um, have struggled a little bit in the past, myself included, going to my mm -hmm. colleagues saying, hey, I have this situation. Do you have any ideas? Because we're, we're supposed to be able to figure it all out. Well, in today's ideas and terms and the way we, the kids that land on our doorsteps, we can't do this alone. And I think that that's one thing that Dr. Lori continues to talk about is that, you know, we are in this together. And when you think about the thermostat and the thermometer, as, she, as she's talked about, um, you know, some of that starts with us as leaders and educators. Where are we? Um, and the COVID hasn't lent itself to um, my awareness some days as an educator. Even last week, I thought, my goodness, Whitney, listen to your tone. I moved towards the end of the day, and I had been, I had been behind the mask all day. And, um, Teachers and other people in the building were having to leave because they were close contacts with four So everyone's pitching in and doing jobs that we're not used to doing. Um, so I think that in itself that day, and I called that kid when I got home that night and talked to his mom because I was like, listen, I I was I really got on to this little guy at the end of the day, and this is what happened. And she was like, oh, don't worry about it. Thanks for calling, but um, it's still building those relationships and admitting when I'm wrong, when I personally am not self-aware of myself. I think the significant piece that has to be there is the ability to pe for people to reach out, but also to be receptive to their peers regulating them when it's necessary. Um, and that's not always, um, I mean, that's just not always easy because it does feel a little bit corrective in nature until you've established those clear relationships with peers and between peers and you've created that culture within the building. Um, and, and, and it can be difficult at times. I remember um, the other thing that would often happen, 
at least early on when we had created the resource room, is that from the outside, as people would walk through, they would just see two or three kids, and they wouldn't understand the significant level of need or the significant level of regulation that was occurring. So it would sometimes look like there were three adults and five kids, and people would be like, well, what's going on in there? I think that was very early on. Um, in the framework. And one of the things that really changed that is exactly what Whitney had mentioned, and that was just inviting other people into that room at times. Um, being very deliberate as an administrator, pushing in. I mean, the, the thing that I noticed, and to be quite frank, it was much easier at the elementary level than it is at the secondary level, is also looking at behavior data and looking at moments so that I positioned extra people in rooms. And so what teachers thought I was doing was putting it in there for kids. And in fact, what I was probably doing was putting it in there more for adults because I could notice spikes in discipline and it was often connected as I would walk through the building to teachers' brain space. And that wasn't me looking at the teacher negatively. That was just me appreciating and approaching uh, them in a different way. And so I think that was kind of important as well. Yes, and to piggyback off of that a little bit, Carrie, and when I came to STAR and you had introduced me to um, the classroom and the building and all of the things, I remember coming in um, that summer to unpack and get things settled. And there was this curtain over the windows and this little mini curtain over the window in the door. And I remember thinking to myself, this is the most uninviting way to promote what we're doing in this room. Let's open it up. Let's be proud of what's going on in here. This isn't a secret because we're all in this together. And I know last week, um, and I've noticed it a little bit um, more and more ever since that curtain came down four years ago, is teachers will come in and sit on their planning times. Not as much this year, probably because we're doing instruction in so many different ways, but coming in and sitting for five or 10 minutes, um, probably because they're self-aware of how they're feeling and just to have conversation mm -hmm. with kids in different ways and or adults. Absolutely. And that's kind of the point of the of that particular hub or that particular room for sure. Um, or it should be, I think, because it, it really has to be, again, that piece of trust about what's happening, not only when kids go into that room, but the way in which do, um, adults are interacting with each other as a result of what happens in that room. Because it can be, well, I would it can like be to kind talk, of undermining talk, we talked a little bit about having PBIS good conversations around the language needs so to shift. So I very shift. much appreciate that. And I would that. love to say that we could build What are you thinking, Phillips, about in that, that, that would what require, and she talks about that dual brain sheet. And we're not doing that yet um, at Charles. I, are you doing that yet at STAR or TEST? Okay. And I think it's... Mm -hmm. No, we're not. Resilience. Yeah, yeah. I'm just and thinking right now us with us ideas. the amount of cuts um, that happen in budgets we, and the extra close people that we would need to, to have as a resilience team, of it, they just don't exist it, no. to the capacity. I think at the mm -hmm. elementary, maybe secondary, you could do it because you have a you have a counselor, you have a dean. I don't know. I don't. But I feel like if there was this this team that when a when a student was showing those signs and we had that trusted adult at any minute available and i think your resource room provides that it lends itself to that we had that a couple years ago at charles when we had over 500 kids and we had a higher need our data doesn't say that we need that now and so our resource room is just for exceptional ed kids our gen ed kids those breaks are within the office with me so i'm that trusted adult but i would really like to see how we could shift to the resilience team and really being able to regulate you know go in and cover that class and regulate the adult before sending that kid back in. So there are significant, I think, yeah, go ahead. go ahead, sorry. I think one of the, we, you know, we have admitted that we don't have the resiliency team into place. We know that. Um, our team talks about it every time we meet. Um, but it hasn't necessarily been mm -hmm. our number one focus as a PBIS team mm -hmm. this school year, it doesn't feel like. 
and no no fault of anyone's um but we're just dealing with some different behaviors since the pandemic lots of family stress that we haven't necessarily seen in the past um one thing that mrs hooker and i and kaylin hooker is our k through two special educator at star um we have kind of opened ourselves up to the teachers then we do a social and emotional lesson um kind of as like oh i don't know bell work or morning work um in the morning um and so after they do their book talk um or they they read a book or however it's however it's presented um, Kaylin and I and some teachers have really kind of dived into this with us. Not all of them are on board yet, but some of them are. Um, we've been introducing some of Dr. Lori's brain aligned strategies for kids. Um, in kindergarten, it is the greatest thing in the whole wide world. It's so cute. But I don't even think that they recognize what they're doing. But when you think about some of our second, third, and fourth graders, um, making contact with them and having some communication and honestly, just having some conversation with kids. Hey, how are you feeling? Let's think about this situation that you just read about. Um, do you have any anything you'd like to add, anything you'd like to talk about? And then using one of her brain aligned strategies to um, help kids learn and to, to build their own school box of ideas. When I get frustrated, um, this is what we can do. Um, we recently, and I, I have this little handout. It was a printout that Dr. Lori had given. Um, we gave this to all of our teachers. Oh, it was um, a couple weeks ago. And I think that that's when we saw an increase of teachers wanting us to come into their rooms. They had a paper copy of something. And I think that flipping through through it, whether they were you know, at home on the couch in the evenings or something like that, then they were being a little more open to say, hey, would you come in and try a couple strategies on page five? Um, so I, that has definitely helped. Tomorrow, Mrs. Hooker and I are going to uh -huh. do a similar presentation. We felt like that we were leaving out some of our teaching assistants and some of our other key, com you know, our key people that show up every single day to work with our kids. So tomorrow we're going to do a little professional development um, with them, just talking about some of these strategies, because the best thing that Dr. Lori has designed through these strategies is that they don't cost a lot of things a lot of money or you don't need a lot of things to implement them um, and so we just thought with i learn and i read coming our way in the next several months you know they're with them in the morning while teachers are cleaning they're with kiddos in the cafeteria they're with kiddos eating lunch in their classrooms this year but this would give them another something yeah, to help and just just implement their practice with kids and it doesn't have to be those kids that have bubbles in their school day, why not talk to all kids about these strategies? Yeah. Those pieces of resiliency teams, I want to go back to that a little bit, because the, the number of adults that are in the building mm -hmm. in the morning, at least in my experience at STAR, allow particular regulation stations so that you could, and, and we've implemented that same strategy. That's a piece of a resiliency team. The other thing that was really important and probably a little bit harder um, at a higher socioeconomic school, quite frankly, that we continue to do is something I did at Star is bring in, and I've talked about that before, those couple of paraprofessionals whose only job it is is to push in and to help regulate and to move kids and sometimes to regulate faculty as well throughout the day. And that's really huge and important. The thing that we just finished doing, and I say we because it had very little to do with me, was we just finished doing our account on calendar that's reviewing those academic skills, but we embedded um, our SEL lessons that we do every week, we embedded that into iLearn and iLearn strategies. So the countdown calendar incorporates both of those things. And that's a piece of resiliency as well. We're listening very carefully mm -hmm. to teachers that say they don't feel comfortable doing it because it's important that they're telling us that they don't feel comfortable doing it because that signals that they're ready to learn how. And there's an acknowledgement that they should. And I think that's a piece of resiliency. I would be... You know, and I think that I think that's the piece of it that um, I would argue in terms of thinking about, of, you know, 
-hmm. And I, I mean, that's what everybody here is saying, but I think what I would offer is people need to be very thoughtful about not only looking at their data, but really um, subjective about Absolutely. what their data is telling them in relationship to move Man. your changes to place. I, I don't know. Um, I just, what, what else, Carrie, really talk really about, cool. What else have you learned Super from key. jumping in? Because I think your story at the end and really talking about, um, so for those of you who are not oh, reading, God. not your story, the star story, sorry. I want to be clear. It is the star story. Um, but it's such a good, it's such a good story to celebrate. And how awesome is it that, well, you know, you guys are in this book. I just, <laughs> I think the, the work that the staff has done um, to get you where uh -huh. you're at. I mean, you went from a D school to a B school. And that was from very intentional practices. So how what else? That, yeah, how did you do that, Whitney? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did we do that, Whitney? <laughs> oh, gosh. Do a lot of hard work, but most importantly, working together. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think that was it. And I, you know, to me, it's very different to have a teacher who experienced that with me sitting here. Um, but to me, it didn't seem that difficult because I just had a really good group of people. And so in relation to finding a group of people that believed in the framework, it was a way of being a way of doing. I mean, I don't mean to dismiss the amount of hard work that was there, um, but we didn't sit around and think an awful lot about being a B. I don't, I mean, we looked at our data, we did interventions, we did strategies, we did academic intervention and peers. I'm not dismissing any of that, please. I mean, and Whitney knows that. But we did spend an awful lot of time talking about our ways of doing and being with each other. So where do schools start? In terms so of our treatment of each other, our words with each other, and so our it's not a typical school year. But and that kind of elicited a, a big high benefit in school, terms of academics. Star was at 95%. And you're a, you're a failing school. You guys did it. What what are you what's the first step in moving to that direction for those schools that are out there watching um, and understand that the shift is happening in their schools, maybe? <laughs> um, so now they need to add that into their academic vocabulary. How how did you guys do that? Is that too hard of a question? Like is that I didn't maybe I didn't phrase it right. I think you described it very well Right. It's all about the relationship. Yeah. How are you, I think we described it very well, what they're still doing. <laughs> right? I think so. It's about building relationships. Um, and most importantly, finding um, where adults fit best. I might be assigned to this role, and I get two weeks into this role and being open and honest about, hey, this this is this is uneasy for me. I'm not feeling like I'm fitting in. Finding out if that adult is still willing to continue where the position that they're in, or whether that we need to shift staff around to make things work. Um, I had a really really tough fourth grade group last year. Um, Mrs. Polk Meek now is serving some of those students at test, and. I had a parent in my room um, that wasn't connecting with some of the kids in the group. And she came to me and said, what am I doing wrong? I was like, you can't do anything wrong with this group. They're just a really specifically challenging group of young men. And they were, they were all boys. They were very competitive. They were very intense from the time they walked through the front door <laughs> until they got on the bus in the afternoon. They, but they wanted to learn, but you had to be really thoughtful about your expectations with them, your tone of voice with them, how assertive you are, probably to this day with Carrie Ann, how assertive you are with them, continue tone of voice. And I was really grateful that this human felt comfortable enough to come to me and say, look, Whitney, this isn't working out for me. Because I know that I went to my own administrator and said, hey, I'm really happy. That's awesome a, a that she's self-reflective because not everybody's help. there either. And so continuing um, to build that those relationships staff, with people our staff will just members so that we can continue to And so being to able to right know and kids. understand that she needed something mm -hmm. different or support mm -hmm. in order to make that connection, that's huge. No, not at all. 
um, and we tweak some of the and really just spend some time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she she actually we tweaked some of the kids that she was working with, um, and we tweaked some of the, the instruction. And really just spent some time together, which made me much more reflective as an educator. Wow, I should have been thinking about doing this. Mm -hmm. And it really it just made me more cognizant of it. So she continues to work with me. And I'm, I, our relationship, mm -hmm. I just can't imagine um, my life at school without her now. Once she kind of opened up the door to what has continued to make the resource room work and flow fluidly. True. Well, you've got it. You've got to have. You've got to be able to have that flexibility when you have people and you have the ability to flex. And that's absolutely true all the time. It's not always possible. And sometimes you just have to be able to take and and try to change or mold whatever you can. Um, available people that are willing to do this kind of work aren't always easy to find. And the older kids get, the harder it is to find them, mm -hmm. um, because their perceptions of what um, kids should be able to do has shifted dramatically. And we're confronted over and over again with the fact that we have kiddos that still can't. It's sometimes hard for people to overcome. Um, but you know, there are you know, uh, we do spend a lot of time training our, our our support staff too. Always, even right from what I've said before, over and over again, right from the very beginning, it starts with the my treasurer and my secretary at test all the way back because they start the regulation process when kiddos and, and adults come in and they know how to catch those signals that kids are throwing at them when they walk in if they walk in late and they're dysregulated and they're tardy um, or whatever it happens to be so that we can put those supports in place and you know the pandemic has been very strange and our numbers have been very strange um, last year this time we had in one month in the month of january we had 180 referrals in January. We've had 18 complete. So we have half of the kids in the building. Ergo, we would, I mean, on average, about 90 referrals, right? I mean, we've got half the kids. We would expect to see half the referrals. We have 18. Um, and, and the thing that's been really significantly different for that in relationship to that are the ones that we have are pretty bad ones, meaning. Uh, maybe significant and um, potentially uh, law involved. I mean, it's been significant. But our ability to be able to harness and access kids and to look at that framework and in advance, it's changed dramatically just in a year. So it is kind of exciting to catch up with Star and see where they're at just a few years later. That's pretty neat. Yeah. I think, Carrie, in our data at STAR reflects um, what you're seeing. Our, our numbers are pretty consistent. We had one month in the holidays that were a little higher than normal. Mm -hmm. um, and after having some conversations with kids that did receive referrals that had never had a referral before, it all boiled down to not seeing family, having Thanksgiving different, having to do Christmas different, um, and so, yeah, you're, 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 you're exactly right. We're, our onslaught of significant mental health issues has, and that's the data that we don't have in referrals, but our onslaught of significant mental health issues in the month of January has spiked to unbelievable level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, mm -hmm. I mean, that's my next concern is how much yep. this framework can serve our adults and the as well as the piece, kiddos, you know, the kids that are year. virtual, I can't imagine no how much you try to connect with for them. all of us. Um, just the lack of instruction they're missing, just not being able to be at school. That that's going to be another piece on top of an, just another layer as you filter everything else in. And, you know, we're all we're probably almost at our 30 minutes because I just love looking at Whitney's face. She makes me so happy. Um, but when you look at this, I know I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm trying not to be too much of a Whitney fan because I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to make her feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But I did want to talk, I mean, this one, starting on 135, 136, 137, it felt like one of, really, she, she talked about accommodations. And I think we often consider accommodations and relationships to behavior plans and FBAs and special ed people. I think we've talked a lot today about how that's not the case. But Whitney, what do you 
talking about those shifts because I've even seen that reflected in the behavior plans that we're seeing coming with your kiddos from STAR and from Bell and some of the other feeder schools that come in to test. And I know from Charles as well. I actually feel like when um, we learned about these strategies, Dr. Lori introduced them in a seminar or something probably around a year ago. Mm -hmm. It took me a little bit of time to digest them. As an educator, we were, you know, this is kind of how you're supposed to write plans. This is kind of how you're supposed to talk to kids. I, I took a different shift with Mrs. Hooker this school year, especially because we knew we were coming back into the classroom and we had been out of the classroom for so long. And that this is how we need to, A, start having conversations with kids. I'm giving you this accommodation, but why? Why am I doing that? Why do I think that you and the committee of people that met to talk about you, we felt like you needed this. So I, we, have, we have, are doing our best to invite students more and more into their IEP meetings. Um, starting from second and all the way to fourth grade, some of our K and first graders aren't there yet. And we aren't there yet either with them, but giving kids some ownership in what they need to have a successful school day um, has turned some of our data around. We're seeing less and less referrals when we get to the third and fourth grade um, grades just because we're having more um, conversations about their accommodations. Also, I think about the way that these are stated. To me, it gives a much more mm -hmm. positive look for parents. It doesn't feel like a bulleted list of phrases and words that I would read out loud during an IEP meeting. It means the word I and you and adults. And so these statements are giving more ownership into the accommodations. This is what we're doing for your child. And it's, it's opening up conversations differently within IEP meetings. Um, and most importantly, with their teachers. It's not that list of, oh, gosh, this is what I have to give little Carrie Ann in the classroom now. It's ideas and points of reflection that are going to make this kid um, successful because it is written with I statements. It isn't the bulleted list. It, it's a little more user friendly. We aren't there 100% um, with every IEP and every kid, but it's like I said earlier, every kid is different. Um, so we're just, we are being reflective in our practices about utilizing these and explaining them and talking about why we're doing it this way and why we're saying it this way. And I'll tell you, the real winner, winner, chicken dinner, is they get over there to fifth and sixth grade, seventh and eighth. And then um, our practice this year has been kids, not uh -huh. kids that um, have behavior plans within their IEPs when they need it, verbalizing that they need it and verbalizing it with and being very aware of the fact that it's part of their plan and the reason that it's there. Um, and that's been that's been very amazing. If we're not having conversations with kids inside their meeting, and you know, this doesn't go just for students that receive special services. You know, we have we have lots of kids um, 504 plans or just other um, small plans um, for kids throughout the school days. If we're not having conversation with them about it, it's not a it's not a well written plan, in my opinion. We have to talk about it because then there's buy-in amongst everybody and it gives everyone a, a sense of peace and ownership with the ideas. And one thing that Kaylin Hooker and I have done um, just extensively is we have a, a lot of students with plans that are general education students and talking to them about, hey, if this isn't working for you, let's talk about it. Tell your teacher that you need to talk to me. Tell your teacher you want to talk to her or him so that we're not waiting a week from now to discover Teaching that this isn't working for you. The big shift These accommodations when, um, aren't working for you. These accommodations can be changed next, the next hour, so the next day, whatever you need. This is your plan. I see you're, you're already seeing it 
but I hope we'll do a better job of that at the elementary yes. level, teaching them to verbalize just like they do mm -hmm. as a reader, what strategy are they using? This is what I need to be successful. So great job. Well, Whitney. Mm -hmm. It is going to be Absolutely. huge. Absolutely. Yeah. So this chapter mm -hmm. ends with um, her reiterating the fact that what if we pre replace the well, word consequences with the word experiences? Absolutely. When a child is presenting mm -hmm. emotional and behavioral challenges, let us ask ourselves, what experiences would help this child begin to learn a new way? And kudos to you, Whitney, you're doing an amazing job providing those experiences. And um, I know you're, you're on the cadre, right? And so yes, being yes. able to have a group of humans too that you can collaborate with and share those experiences that are working for your kids. And I just hope for our district that that continues to flourish and um, yeah. can bring yes. back to- Yes, yes. The library in itself has so much success that we have been you know, Just like we talked about earlier, we're all organizing that. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the cadre in itself has changed since the pandemic Absolutely. you know just like well, we talked about you. earlier we're all realizing that right. we're in this together let's share Absolutely. ideas let's have conversations well, Whitney, thank you so, so much for joining us to be today it's together. been great talking with you mm -hmm. next week well, we're going to talk about early childhood well brain alight really. discipline so Absolutely. Um, we'll talk about those littles a little bit more next week but continue to do what you're doing because it's showing exactly. and um, good luck to the rest to you for the rest of the school year as we move continue to move through this pandemic. But hopefully, as spring comes, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Absolutely. Thank you, ladies.